Welcome to our midweek service. Uh, this is River of Life uh, Church in El Monte. My name is Mike Vidalas, and um, today is June 8th, 2022. And there is a topic uh, that we're going to be going over uh, that uh, is from a familiar story in the Bible. But before we get started, I'd like to go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for being uh, here with us, Lord. Father, we ask that you would clear our minds, give us understanding. Lord, challenge our hearts, God, by the subject that, Lord, we would hear by your very word. The scriptures that we hear, Lord, Father, they are meant to challenge, educate, encourage, rebuild, and restore us, God, Father. We ask for your will to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout the many episodes of the encounters that Jesus had with individuals in the Bible, tonight I'm going to only focus on one of those encounters. But here are just some of those encounters. And to remind you of those that have diligently um, read throughout the scriptures, these are certain uh, instances where Jesus uh, encountered certain people. Jesus met the woman by the well in John chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus met with Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 2. Jesus had an encounter with the demon-possessed man who lived in the tombs in the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus met the blind man, Mark, in chapter 8, verse 22. Jesus uh, encountered the crippled man in Bethsaida in John chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus encountered the man with leprosy in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2. And finally, Jesus had an encounter with a centurion with a paralyzed servant in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. But tonight, we are going to be ministering on Jesus' encounter with the adulterous woman found in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. That will be our text for this evening. It is in the NIV version. So if uh, you do not happen to have your Bible with you, we have the scriptures uh, here available for you to follow along as I read. Uh, verse 1 says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. So uh, we find here that at this this moment uh, that they are wanting to find out how he's going to respond, but the intention is to catch him in a trap, and uh, you're going to see why. Uh, let's continue. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9. At this, those who, heard be, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there. Jesus strained up and asked for her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Her answer would be, No one, sir. 
Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. First point I want to make here is in reading this these uh, scriptures and these verses is let's focus on the setup. Okay, Jesus is being set up here. And let's go to verses 1 through 6. And I'll point these out for you too. Uh, we read verse 1 that says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again. So when I read that, I see that Jesus was already establishing a pattern to minister at the temple courts. So that gave the Pharisees an opportunity to know that he was frequently arriving at the temple and also that he was going to be doing it again and again and so forth. So they already knew that their, Jesus was establishing a pattern in ministering at the temples and uh, uh, gathering people around him and uh, ministering to them and meeting to their needs. As we continue, it says, again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him and he sat to teach them. The teachers of the law, get this, okay? There's two groups of people here. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. So these are the two uh, groups of people that are focusing on and have set up a trap for Jesus. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman, uh, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, here is the revelation of why it's a trap. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. To this current, at this current time, they could not find him guilty of anything. Um, they did want to put an end to it as quickly as possible. His popularity was growing. Uh, people were being attracted and drawn to him by the signs, the miracles, the wonders. Uh, just the fluency of him knowing uh, the scriptures, um, his love and attention towards children and people and the elderly, and so forth. In uh, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, the Bible states that um, it says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is the story of Joseph. And if you know the story of Joseph, he was thrown into a pit by his brothers. Um, Joseph's life uh, took a tragic toll um, after leaving and being departed from where he grew up at and uh, had a rough time in life. Uh, until God turned everything around. And see, here, here is a perfect example that we're going to come and uh, 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 explain to you, uh, is that whatever the bad circumstance looks at in the beginning, however difficult or challenging it may be, and this applies to your life as well as mine, is that God, in a fraction of days, minutes, hours, seconds, can turn it all around for his good. Amen. So let's go to our second point. Is that one of the things that we learned is number one, is that he was being set up. It was the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were setting him up. Number two, is that Jesus already knew the heart and the intention of those around him. See, they were uh, the group of people Let's call it for what it is. The accusers. They were accusers. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were accusing this woman of an adulterous act. And there was a victim. And who was the victim? Well, it was the supposedly adulterous woman. 
See, you can't pull the wool over God's eyes at any time in life. He knew the scheme. He knew the intention of this action and the purpose for it. So here you must understand that even though the teachers of the laws and the Pharisees have their own scheme to uh, set Jesus up, Jesus is well aware of it and always confident. And uh, you'll understand what I mean by confident. See, there was a crowd there of people that Jesus was ministering to. And in comes in another crowd, which is the teachers of the law and the Pharisees with this woman. And they throw the woman at Jesus' feet and um, uh, ask Jesus to uh, make judgment, make a judgment call as to what is to be done with this lady. Uh, they knew his schedule of ministering in every town at every temple. And to you and I, that's like our local church. So they came up with this plan to set him up, but unfortunately at the cost of using a victim. Psalms chapter 7 verse 9 says, Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God who probes minds and hearts, Ladies and gentlemen, at any given time, God knows our intentions, our motives, our ideas, and our thoughts. And there too, being in front of the people, ministering, so forth, and being interrupted by a new mob of people, he knew what was going on. He wasn't caught off guard. Let's come to our third point, is that the position he was put in was to be that of a judge. They come to him and they say, we want you to make uh, a decision in this matter. We want your opinion. We want to understand what is it that you think should be done in this case, in this matter. Let's look at our text in verses three through six. They made her stand before the group which is the group, the group that gathered around. Not only was it the group of the mob that came in to bring in and follow the teachers and the, um, the Pharisees and, and uh, bring in the adulterous woman, but it was also a group there that was being ministered to and educated by Jesus, the uh, teacher, amen? So uh, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? What is your opinion on this matter? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. In other words, the whole group the pressure, what is Jesus going to respond? How is he going to respond in this matter? Now, I want to point out to you something very important, and I'll try to break it down as easy as possible. Now, understand this. These are old times, but there, there were laws that were in effect that were not followed. See, you must understand is that you always need to present witnesses in any case, in every case, if at all possible. They said she was caught in the act of adultery, but we understand that, and we must uh, ask ourselves, where was the other individual involved? Supposedly, she was caught with this other individual, but he's nowhere to be found. There is no uh, one bringing him in, into the, uh, into the uh, scene here. He broke the law also. Am I correct in saying that there were two people that were involved, and they only grabbed the lady, and they brought the lady to Jesus? But when it was 
in actuality, two people involved in the breaking of this law. Witnesses are used to give credit to the accusation or debunk any accusation. So we understand that if there was this woman brought before Jesus, there needs to also be some witnesses. You following with me? Everything so far was hearsay. They, a crowd brings Jesus, this woman, and they say she was caught in the act of adultery. Okay, um, where's the other individual? Where are the witnesses? To stir up your mind here, to give you understanding, you need to, uh, are you following me? Everything was hearsay. Where are the individuals that caught her in the act? Okay, were they in the crowd? We don't know. If this were true, how did they know where she would be and at what time she would be with the other so-called person? Here's something to ponder on this, okay? Um, how did they know where this woman would be and who she would be with, okay? She could have been set up. This is what I'm trying to say. This is just one opinion that, and one viewpoint that we must see. She could have been set up to meet someone she already knew at a certain time and at a certain place. So the accusers could catch her at this location. Once again, they wouldn't know where this woman would be at unless they prearranged everything ahead of time. Not necessarily doing anything wrong would it be for that woman to show up had she been invited, had she been told um, please come here at such a point, such an address, at this certain time, she could have been set up. But then again, we have a married woman, which is called the adulterous woman, meeting in a location with a man. Right then and there, you know, minds start wandering. Oh my gosh, you know, it must be true. She, she met up with this certain man at this certain location. At this point, it is her reputation that is questioned and also her intention of meeting this other person. Did she really do anything wrong? You got to think about that. Did she really do anything wrong? Or was it set up to look like it? Women did not have the say they nowadays have in our time. As you notice, no one gave her the opportunity to say her side of the story. The accusers had already riled up the crowd, and it sure looked like there was going to be a stoning party right outside the temple where Jesus was at. Here is what I see. The flexing of the powers of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees they were guiding everyone to believe this was a done deal and the life of this accused woman was, in, was now in the hands of Jesus, the teacher. So let's continue. Yes, Jesus was put in the position to be the judge of this woman's action. But instead of being forced to be the judge... Jesus, understand this, Jesus took the role of her Savior, of being her Savior. Let me say, the, say this and repeat it one more time. Yes, Jesus was put in the position to be the judge of this woman's actions. But instead of being forced to be the judge, Jesus took the role of being her Savior. There are times when we are backed into the corner because of life circumstances and situations. The world is always up against us. The facts seem to point out that we have broken some sort of law. We feel alone. We can't find someone to represent us. 
of what we've been accused of. We seem to be always facing judgment from the world on our character, on our identity, on our credibility. It feels like a crowd is forming against us with rocks in their hands, ready to end our life. Our life is in the balance like the accused adulterous woman. Who is to represent us? Who is to back us up? Who is there to support us and to stand in for us? Let's go back to our text in verses 6 through 11, and I want to point something out. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You must understand something at this moment, that the breaking of that law of uh, uh, catching an adulterous woman in the act of of um, disobeying the law was punishable by death. And what they would do, it was they would gather those around uh, that are around the, the uh, guilty and they would stone them. They would take stones from the ground, some being big, some being small, some being incredibly heavy, and they would pummel the person to the point of death. And that was... Back then, the, the uh, law, uh, and that was the law of Moses. Uh, we find that in the Old Testament. But I want to focus on something right now. Where Jesus says, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. I read that part and I said, why are the older ones, uh, the, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the older ones in that group, in that crowd, why are they the ones that are leaving first? Why are they the ones that are dropping their rocks first? And it says, uh, with the woman still being there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Her answer was, as she looks around, No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Everyone asks, what is it that he wrote on the ground, that Jesus wrote on the ground? Honestly, we may have to wait to ask that question directly to Jesus. We don't understand. But one thing I do know is that we can estimate, we can guess, and these are a couple things that may have crossed your mind or currently crossing your mind. Did he write on the dust that he knew what their plan was all along? As he bent down, he may have written, this is a setup. I know what you're trying to do here. Did he write the names of those who schemed all of this up in order to trap him? One by one, he could have written the names. These are those involved in this treacherous plot against me. One by one, he could have written their names down. Did he write on the dust that he knew the woman was being set up as much as he was? This woman did no wrong. She was set up by you. Did he write on the dust that the woman was innocent but had sins that were not related to what she was being accused of. This woman is not blameless. She is and has sin in her life, but what you accuse her of, 
she is not guilty of. Jesus could have done all these things and written all these things there. But finally, in ending this, I'm going to have you turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. The funny thing here with this scripture is it talks about those that forsake the Lord will be written, have their names written in the dust. And so when we go back to the scripture as to why it was that the uh, older gentlemen, the older teachers of the law left first is because maybe this scripture popped into their mind and they knew that they were in the wrong. They knew that they were trying to deceive and deceiving and setting up and lying and planning and scheming. These are not the actions of the teachers of the law or Pharisees. They're not to be involved in these types of actions. But yet, maybe it was the guilt of knowing this familiar scripture because they did know the scriptures. And they did know that whatever he was writing there and whatever they perceived or seen him writing convicted their lives because they were in the wrong. They were doing something wrong. So what happens? What happens to the woman? Well, we understand that Jesus helps her up. We understand that she goes on her way, but she's encouraged by the Lord, not as uh, her judge, but confronted her as a savior. And that's what reminds me and you, and, and it should it should permeate in our hearts is that when we encounter Jesus in, and we encounter Jesus and we come to God, we think that God is ready to bash us with a stone that maybe he picked up and our condition of our heart being sinful. But you know what? Because of Christ coming into our lives, because of him stepping in and paying the price on Calvary. There is no stone for us, but there is only a welcoming and a turning around of our lives because he is now introduced to us as a savior. What am I trying to get to is the fact that you may not know Jesus, the Lord himself as the savior. Well, my focus is on introducing you to Jesus, the Savior, and not the judge. The judge part comes when we just persist on doing what we want to do in life, resisting the call upon our life, the challenge upon our life to let go and let God be a part of your life. See, folks, we cannot ever attain um, the forgiveness of sins without the help of Christ, without him accepting him into our lives. We can't do anything without Christ. And that's why he came and he died 2,000 years ago, that you and I would have a relationship with God, that you and I would have an opportunity to say, yes, Lord, forgive me of all my past, forgive me of all my sins, and I accept you as Lord and Savior. I follow you forever. Um, and I, I ask you to welcome me into heaven. And that's all we have to do. And if that's your intention tonight, and you feel that God is speaking to your heart, and that you feel like maybe this world is misjudging you, and you feel the pressure of everything on, in life being on top of you, 
then I give you this opportunity tonight to welcome Jesus into your heart, to make him Lord and Savior of your life. If you would just take this moment, bow your head and repeat this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I invite you into my heart, my heart that needs forgiveness, that needs your cleaning through the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. I ask that, Lord, you deliver me from my past, my sins, everything that weighs upon me. I ask you, Lord, Father, you lead me, you guide me into a different life. Let it be filled with your love, your compassion, as I've read, as we've been ministered to this day, that you are compassionate and you are the Savior of the world. In Jesus' name, I pray this in faith. Amen. You've asked the Lord into your heart by a simple prayer. That's the beginning. Next thing you want to do is you want to get into a, a Christ-filled church, Bible-believing people to surround you, to educate you. Get into a good church. Look for one. Uh, call us. Give us a, 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 a little uh, an email. And we can point you in the right direction. Um, we're located in Almani. Um, and we'd love to have you uh, 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 come on out and visit with us as well. But with that in mind, I hope you learned something. I hope the Spirit of God ministered to you and, and taught you uh, uh, something that uh, you can take and maybe share with other people. And, and uh, my goal, my, my, my desire is that to have the opportunity to minister to as many people as I can before the coming of the Lord. With that in mind, may you be blessed and we'll see you soon. Thank you and God bless you.